And this pick guard is totally wrong. This is something Gibson never even used. Big as hell, man. This is... I just paid 1500 dollars for that. Ouch. Is it worth anything? It, yeah, maybe about a hundred bucks. <laughs> Good day, folks. Today we will show you all the times when the Pawn Stars lost thousands of dollars on terrible deals. So, first things first, have you already bought this? That sounds bad. It's a complete fake. Damn it, Rick. Player gets played. Rick buys an illiterate baseballer's signature for $13,000. A bug-eyed twerp walks into the shop with a battered look. He opens the front page and shows Rick two faint signatures. Apparently, one of them was signed by the legendary Shoeless Joe Jackson. I have a book signed by Shoeless Joe Jackson. Oh. It's actually signed by him. Right. It's absolutely incredible. The same one who is infamous for being part of the Black Sox team that fixed the 1919 World Series. Yeah, the story is that him and seven other guys on the 1919 Chicago White Sox took money to fix the World Series. Rick was so excited, he practically scammed himself. Plus, Joe Jackson was a baseball legend. He was legend. such a good hitter, Babe Ruth actually copied his style. If it wasn't for the scandal, there is no doubt that he would make it to the Hall of Fame. The guy stood by as Rick went on and on about the baseball legacy of Shoeless Joe Jackson before asking for $30,000. So how much did you want to get out of it? I'd like to get like $30,000 for the book. Even with a certificate of authenticity, Rick refused to go a cent beyond $13,000. How about $16,000? $13,000, I won't go a penny more. I mean, ask for $1 more, you can just pick the book up and leave. But I'll go $13,000. If you do that, I'll do it. The guy reluctantly agreed. Okay, let, let's do it. All right, deal, man. Great, okay. Rick was shocked when the experts pronounced the signature as a feeble imitation. A hot blonde walks in with a valuable comic collection. Not suspicious at all. Chum is at the counter when a blonde lady walks in with seven boxes of her uncle's comic book collection. I have my uncle's comic book collection. He passed away and this was handed down this to me. pretty cool. Is there anything? He dives into the boxes and ignores Antoine, who advises him to call Paul, the comic book expert. So you acting like you're an expert in this. Whatever, bro. You better get somebody down here that knows what they're talking about. Dude, I don't need Paul. These are comic books. The lady wants to take her kids on vacation, so she asks for $2,000. What exactly are you looking to get for him? I'd like to get $2,000. Chum counter offers $350, but the lady refuses to budge. I'll give you 50 bucks a box. That's 350. Can you do 500? Do 450 on him? 500 is going to be the lowest I what can do you go. think? I don't, I don't want no parts of this if you don't call Paul down here. Her price is 500 Chum eventually gives in. Life is about chances, and sometimes you just got to take them. I'm going to do the 500 I'm going to show everyone what an expert I really am. When Rick demands an expert's evaluation, Chum does not like what he has to say. Some really cool stuff. Yeah, duh. Uh, you got First Taskmaster, First Nova, Red Hulk. Some good stuff. There's Doctor Strange in there. Yeah, I said it did pretty good. 18 of the comics are worth $200, and Bruh. the rest are are five cents a piece. This stack I pulled is probably 200 bucks retail. And the other couple hundred pounds of comic books are worth? Five cents a book if you're lucky. It's like it's common stuff. There's nothing high grade, nothing that's really worth getting certified. How many of them are there? 300 in a box, so 2,100. You spent 500 bucks on some comic books I'll be lucky to get like 180 bucks out of. And seven boxes are the recyclable paper. So they're basically worthless. No, they're not worthless. <sighs> Thanks for stopping by, man. Anytime. Appreciate it. Judas's lost piece of silver, the shekel of tire. Rick serves a customer who comes in with a shekel of tire, an ancient coin from the time of Jesus Christ. What do you got here? It's a shekel of tire, like from the Bible. Rick delivers the bad news that since the coin has been cleaned. Everything about this is right. It's perfect. The problem is. Cleaned it. Any coin collector considers a clean coin a damaged coin. If this wasn't clean, I'd offer you $5,000 for it. Wow. Which coin collectors consider damaged, its value falls from $5,000 to $1,600, which the guy accepts. Too easy, right? Now the big question is, how much do you want for it? $2,000. Will you take fourteen? How about seventeen fifty? Fifteen hundred. dollars I could do sixteen. Yeah, sixteen hundred. Deal. Okay. Andy, the head of security at the Gold and Silver Pawn Shop, tells the team that the shekel had been reported as stolen property. What's up? 
An out-of-town detective has called Las Vegas police. Shekel that you recently brought in. There's a chance it might be stolen. They want to put it on hold. Though their customer did not steal it, the law still compels the shop to return it. Coin we've been working with the police on. Turns out that the guy who originally owned it got compensated for his loss. It's ours. They released it this morning. So it's not stolen. Dodged the bullet there. Lucky for Rick, the owner's insurance company had already compensated for the theft, which meant it legally belonged to the shop. Luckily for us, the coin was insured and the insurance company paid for the loss. So that makes the coin free and clear. Unfortunately, Rick discovers that he overpaid for the coin because the most it could sell for is $1,200. Chum buys a $100 fake Gibson mandolin for $1,500. A guy looking to take his family on vacation to Ireland comes in to sell his vintage Gibson mandolin. I have a Gibson mandolin. If I play a couple tones? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. The lucky guy finds Chum unaccompanied at the oh, counter. No. Hey, Rick. Corey, Rick. I guess no one's here. The guy asks for $3,000. What are you trying to get for well, it? Well, I'd like to get three grand out of it if I could. Would you be willing to go uh, any less? Chum's spending limit is $1,000, but the cooler than ice customer gets him to pay $1,500. Actually, I have a spending limit of $1,000. I'm not supposed to go any higher than that. $1,300. $1,895. I'll go $1,400. That's pushing the barrel. $1,500, and we got a deal. $1,500 sounds fair. I can make a 15? profit. All right, that sounds good. I appreciate it. Chum's jaw drops when the expert tells him he was fooled by a poor replica. And this pick guard is. Totally wrong. This is something Gibson never even used. Big as hell, man. <laughs> that is worth about $100. I just paid $1,500 for that. Ouch. Is it worth anything? It, yeah, maybe about 100 bucks. <laughs> Rick buys a fake 1890s CX Youth Indian vest, $1,300. Rick bought a CX youth vest from the 1890s for $1,300. I was looking to sell it. And how much were you looking for? $1,800. I'll tell you what, I'll give you $1,200 for it. Would you go $14? I'll tell you what, I'll meet you in the middle at $13. That's what I could do. All right, I'm going to go with that. He thought he had made a good deal because the customer had asked for $1,800. As usual, Corey was very excited to watch his father make a huge mistake. Yeah, the beadwork, it looks to be Sioux or it's, it's Northern Plains beadwork, unfortunately. I don't think this is from that time period. I love it when my dad makes mistakes. The expert told Rick that though the vest was Indian made, it was neither from the 1890s nor for home use. Apparently, the vest was a much less valuable type that the Indian tribe made for sale. It's basically a fake. It's modern. I No, I wouldn't say it's a fake. I think it's Indian made for sale. It's not made for use. Who thought Rick would end up on the wrong side of capitalism? Rick Rock and Roll, Vic Flick's Fender Strap Guitar. Vic Flick walks in with his 1961 Olympic white Fender Strap Guitar looking to sell it for $70,000. It's a 1961 Fender Stratocaster. So where did you get this thing? This guitar's been with me for years. I've worked. How much are you looking to get out of it? Seventy thousand dollars. I'm going to call someone up who knows everything about a guitar, knows everything in the world about music. I'm just basically going to ask him: Is does your name make it worth that much? Oh, I see. Okay. So he, Jesse's store is just a few blocks away, so he'll be okay. down a little bit. Okay. All right. Sure. I'll be right no back. problem. No problem. The expert is excited to meet Vic Flick and agrees that the guitar is worth sixty thousand to seventy thousand dollars. You know, a really good condition, 61 in Olympic white, probably be about a $35,000 guitar on its own. Okay. Um, let alone with the pedigree of this guitar. You've heard this guitar probably more times than you even realize. You've heard this particular guitar. Probably true, yeah. Yeah, easily $60,000, $70,000. This is cool. This is like beyond cool. Okay, well, thanks a lot, man. No, I'm, no problem. Um... Eventually, Rick and Flick agree on a $50,000 price tag. We take 50 grand for it. I'm looking more towards the 70, maybe 65. I mean, you're sort of a rock star, and that, that's my quandary when I go to sell this. Do you go 60? $5,000. All right. Deal, yeah, OK. Let's go do some paperwork. OK. Cool. At an auction in 2014, the guitar sold for $25,000, costing Rick at least $30,000. Corey's strikeout, Willie Mays' uniform. 
When Corey paid $31,000 for a 1961 game-worn Willie Mae San Francisco Giant uniform, he expected to make a killing. Willie Mae's uniform. I got this jersey with the matching pants underneath. $31,000, call it a game. Sounds good. All right. Mainly because the customer had initially asked for $45,000. Give me an idea of what you want for it. I think around $45,000 would be a fair offering. Corey decided to overlook the seller's lack of authentication paperwork. Not even Chums' concerns about the clean and pristine uniform tempted Corey to reconsider. I mean, the jersey feels authentic. I just, there's, I have no way of telling for sure that it's real. I'm very confident it's real. I mean, the way you when an expert said that the uniform was original but was game issued rather than game worn, Corey decided to go for it anyway. One thing I'm just not seeing is to it. This thing appears to be in immaculate condition, especially for its age which leads me to believe that it's game issued versus game used. The gold and silver pawn shop tried to sell it for $80,000 and lacked any takers. They put the uniform up for auction and only Bruh. received $19,200. Details later emerged that the uniform was only worth $3,000 because it did not belong to Mays. It was the type sold by Spalding's salesman back in the day. Talk about a swing and a miss. Rick buys fake Wells Fargo strongbox for $450. Rick rarely buys unauthenticated items. When a graying customer with a handlebar mustache shows Rick a Wells Fargo strongbox and a colonial ball and chain. What do we have here? Well, we got a Wells Fargo strongbox and some antique ball and chain. Okay, you do have a ball and chain and a few old uh, handcuffs. I've had a ball and chain for 50 some years, son. <laughs> Don't talk about my mother that way. <laughs> Rick identified the shackles as fakes. When they forged chains back in the 1800s, it was just hot welding together. You know, get it hot, beat it together. 1800s, they didn't have arc welding. It was all done by a blacksmith. That's why I have a problem with these chains. They're electrically welded. See how these have arcs from an arc welder? Sure, okay. Okay, and my other big concern, never in the history of any prison did they ever have their name put on the balls. Okay, so what are you trying to say? It's fake but was persuaded to consider the box. The box might be real. The handles, I mean, that's classic American cast iron, probably from Chicago. All right, so that makes a lot more sense. This makes me feel a lot better about the box. The customer's asking price was 1,200. Box, I'll give you 400 bucks for. I want $1,200 for it. But he finally accepted $450. 800. I just don't see me getting that kind of money out of it. I, I see me getting 600 bucks, maybe. I'd like to at least get $500 for it. I'll meet you in the middle of 450. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Pretty little filthy. Hey, thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> when Rick called in the expert, he discovered he had been duped. 19th century strong box, Els Fargo, sure. necessary because, you know, you were handling currency, you were handling gold, you're handling silver. You couldn't ship that unless it shipped in a strong box. So, first things first, have you already bought this? That sounds bad. It's a complete fake. Damn it, Rick. Even worse, the old man insisted he knew the box had been a fake all along. He only allowed Rick to buy it so he could hold something over his head. I thought it was fake to start with. Well, then why didn't you say anything? I didn't want to bust your bubble. What, so you let me spend the money instead? Now I can holler at you. <laughs> 1964 Austin Healy Sprite BRG. When a customer brought Rick a 1964 Austin Healey Sprite, he did not need much convincing. Austin Healeys are the type of unique vintage cars that can begin a bidding war amongst collectors. This tiny British car is one of the smallest ever made. Rick knew that some American collectors would do anything to own a 1964 Austin Healey. Unfortunately, the car would not start. This significantly lowered its value. Rick forked over $5,000, half the asking price, without investing the cost of repairs. After discovering that fixing the car would cost $6,000, Rick was devastated. After weighing his options, he decided to sell the car as it was and pass on the cost of repairs to whoever bought it next. 1932 Ford Model B Roadster A restorer invited Rick and Corey to check out a 1932 Ford Model B Roadster. I got a call from a guy who wants to sell his classic 1932 Ford. How's it going? You got a 1932 Ford Roadster here, steel body. It's nice. He claimed to have spent three years and $60,000 to restore the Ford Classic. So what are you looking to get out of it, man? I have 140 in it. I have 80 
in parts, and I'm figuring three years of labor is around 60. I'd like to get 70. Generally on these things, it's a labor of love, <laughs> not That's, a labor of money. You're right, <laughs> yes. Rick had a different idea. Do you mind if I have a buddy look at it? No, go ahead. Okay, I'll be back. After calling in an expert, Rick confirmed that the car was in excellent shape. Realistically, I would see a car like this. The, uh, 70 to 75 thousand okay. dollar range. I don't want to be a downer here, but there's no way in the world that you're ever going to recoup the money that you've got in this. It's the type of thing that you do out of love. That's right. Yeah. And they settled on a price tag of $68,250. $65,000 cash. 69. We do 67 for it. 6850. 6750. 6850. 68250. All right, 68250. All right, we got a deal, man. Thank you. Later on, Rick discovered that his expert was not so experienced after all. The car was a hot rod modification of the original and was only worth about $50,000. Rick lost more than $18,250 on this deal. We'd love to know what you thought of our list. Tell us in the comment section below. Craving some more awesome videos to feed your reality TV habit? Click on one of these videos to keep the show going.